What people definitely need to understand is that unlike visual arts like paintings and sculpture, the CD-ROM is not the final product of art when it comes to video games. It is the software and artwork recorded within that are the game. Just like Clark and Mitchell argue, I am also a firm believer that many computer games belong in the category of literary arts with movies and television because of their narrative elements, which can suffer the same criticism like other narrative arts. Not every single game has a narrative aspect though. Just look at Tetris or Pong, pioneers in the world of video games. It is quite interesting that, even though these games have absolutely no narrative aspect to them, they are still played today in a variety of shapes and forms. I mean, their concept remains the same, and that is another characteristic of art. The fact that art, or at least good art, lasts. Obviously, it is highly unlikely that people will still be playing games like Bugs Life a thousand years from now. It is, however, very possible that people will still be playing Pokemon a thousand years from now, or at least a very updated version of it. Tetris is so simple and entertaining that it could still be played for hundreds of years. Let me pose a question to you. Could video games be considered art? In the next couple of videos, we'll be discussing another very controversial question. Which is, can esports be considered sports? And the answer to both of these is simple, and I can answer it right now. Yes. But only if the people who surround these mediums have the courage and the vision to make it so. It is an unarguable truth that there's something about video games' as interactive nature that differentiates them immediately from most of their art forms like television and film. There's also one more very specific aspect of video gaming that can also allow people to name it what could only be described of as a craft. Namely, the fact that there's always a struggle, or at least in online gaming, against a human opponent. The skill factor present in most online games makes it so that players that compete against each other become sometimes as competitive as you would find some athletes to be due to the natural competitiveness of regular sports. There is one major difference though. Games have the capability to directly transport their active audience into a whole new virtual world, only through audiovisual media. This new medium presents a whole new universe of possibilities, waiting to be further explored. But for some, it is nothing but a frightening glimpse at a future detached from reality or a waste of time. Donna Haraway, writer of A Cyborg Manifesto, tries to accurately pin down a definition for a cyborg. She comes to the conclusion in her study that cyborgs are hybrids of machines and organisms, oppositional and utopian in their resistance to biological, economic and technological determinisms. Having no father, mother, feelings, weaknesses or dreams, she recognizes them as post-human entities. But why am I bringing this topic into the history of esports? Well, because that's how it all begins for professional gamers. And before even delving into the actual historical moments and accomplishments of online video gaming that made esports one of the most prevalent socio-cultural movements of today, we have to understand what the people that surround them feel. Because in the end, what has allowed esports to grow in the way that they have grown today is none other than the fans with their devotion and outright obsession for the medium. Even though Haraway does not directly refer to video games in her studies, it's quite natural for us to recognize video game characters, or avatars, as a species of cyborg, and within them, there is big potential for what Haraway senses in the convergence of human and machine. One's avatar, especially when games like World of Warcraft or The Sims allows us to personalize it, is nothing more than our own projection in a virtual world that was created for the sole purpose of us as an audience to explore it within the comfort and safe environment of our house or public cafe. Just like Brown mentions, we are still able to talk, travel or trade through our avatars, but they'll always be stronger, more beautiful and more menacing. 
they'll both conceal and reveal our own personality, serve as a way to channel instinctual aggression, acquisitiveness, or lust, whilst never really allowing us as humans to feel pleasure or pain. What makes our avatars unique and, in a sense, very different from us is their immunity to death and fatal diseases. But there's also one thing that makes us, in turn, unique and different from them. They are nothing without us. In fact, most games, they don't even exist if not for our personal input. They are like a suit for us to wear whenever we feel like escaping from harsh reality. Like Haraway's cyborgs, they are able to reflect our most utopian dreams, but at the same time, will never, or until now haven't been able to, be more than itself, dreams. Competition in video games has always been a central and desirable aspect. Ever since the first arcade games came out, like Pong, competition between players has brought people back to the game corner. Even in single-player games like Tetris or Puzzle Bubble, skill was differentiated through high-score achievements, and most of the time, top players in each game had the ability to etch their names in three-letter combinations, thus allowing them the ability to show off to subsequent players until they had been beaten by someone better than them. What directly makes esports so much more intriguing and competitive, though, is their sheer complexity and, in this sense, they are very much comparable to regular sports. Just as a volleyball team requires different elements to be successful, a shorter but nimbler libero that's focused on defending and a towering but stronger middle player whose only obligation is to pin the ball down on the court as quick as possible, League of Legends teams work best when there's a variety of players with different roles fighting towards the same goal. Versatility can be very well rewarded, and even more important is the synergy between the champions in each team. Usually, a team that's made up of a mage, bruiser, assassin, marksman, and a healer has a higher advantage versus a team full of squishy spellcasters. The reason for this is that there will always have to be a balance for each role. Tanks can take a lot of damage, but won't be able to put out enough damage. Spellcasters are the opposite. Lots of damage from afar, but crumble quickly when someone can close the gap and knock their tiny health bars down. You can't have a team full of Ronaldos in football, can you? You will need an experienced goalkeeper, a strong center back, and smart middle players. Variety creates potential. Synergy is strength. There's little doubt about the impact gaming has been having around the world. Video games are being played right at this moment, everywhere from Lisbon to Hong Kong to London, between gamers that are connected via the internet almost instantly. Broadcast costs have also been going steadily down due to the constant rivalry that online streaming websites pose, and also due to the tenacity of entrepreneurs and sponsors. But just like we have previously mentioned, what really drives esports to the top is the passion of players, tournament organizers, investors, game developers, and fans. Lee states that no one initially got into esports to get rich or even make money in the first place. But in today's world, they can. If the NBA and NFL are entering a fat and lucrative middle age, esports is still the 25-year-old who got a killer job but hasn't quite figured out his life yet. And the reason for this is that there's just one country leading this revolutionary movement. And that country isn't the United States. Korea is actually the pioneer of several areas of online gaming, all the way from software development to esports and its leagues. In Korea, gaming has moved from the mere leisure activity to become a social and cultural phenomenon, simply because it is widely accepted that playing online games actually involves active socializing skills. This is why the current Korean generation is being called the game generation. And the big difference here between the Korean society and the Western society that we know is in fact the way people perceive video games and the people that dedicate their lives to them. If an English esports team would manage to win a world championship, perhaps they'd get to take a picture with Wayne Rooney, national football star. If a Korean football team won the world championship, maybe they'd get to take a picture with Faker, national esports star and local celebrity. When you look at gaming around the globe, Korea is the leader in almost every single way. And the reason for it is that when it comes to gaming, Korea is the developed market, and the rest of the world is trying to follow in its footsteps.